Do you want to read books that challenge capitalism and give you tools to fight back against oppression? Surviving Society is partnering with radical independent publisher Pluto Press to bring you books by exciting young authors as well as classics by writers who defined our movements. Throughout 2024, you can grab 50% off all books on their website by using the code SURVIVING50. Go to plutobooks.com to check out the books. Welcome to Surviving Society Presents, the Black Health and Humanities Network podcast. These episodes focus on the politics of black health in modern society. Hello everyone, I'm really excited today to be in the studio with Arya and Tanisha. Uh, Arya Thampuran is an assistant professor in Black Health and Humanities at Durham University and looks at non-biomedical ways of understanding distress through healing. I'm also in the studio with Tanisha Spratt, who is a senior lecturer in racism and health at King's College. Tanisha looks at how racism impacts health outcomes. But Tanisha also is interested in how the way people see us impacts our health and our sense of self. This is a really exciting episode for us because it's part of our Black Humanities podcast series. And I have been learning so much about black health. So grateful for Aria for leading on this work and just really excited to be in the studio today because we are talking about black joy. Yes. (laughs) And I guess just for just for the the listeners, how would we connect black joy with black health? I mean, it it feels quite obvious actually even saying it out loud. But what are the kind of interests there for you both? I have been talking about how black joy is a concept. So, yeah, it's integral to black health because in order to survive, you need joy like Black people wouldn't have survived if there was no joy because with joy comes hope and that hope is necessary for survival. A lot of people use black joy as a way to kind of counter the negative health effects of black pain and constant kind of exposure to black suffering. Um, And that's kind of where we've seen over the past couple of years with the murder of George Floyd and the kind of resurgence of Black Lives Matter. What we've seen on social media is this kind of... um, influx of images of of black people laughing and kind of dancing Um, and actually in Ava DuVernay's documentary 13th have you all seen yeah Uh, so at the end she finishes with a montage of like images of black joy so seeing like black families and black people laughing Mm -hmm. to kind of it's it's very intentional it's a way of kind of countering the the horrible kind of atrocities that we've been exposed to for the past like hour and a bit in this documentary Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah it's like a way of kind of some people use it as a way of offsetting the negative health effects of black pain and black suffering by focusing on something that is, yeah, joyful and happy. Black joy is resistance. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we've been speaking quite a bit about joy or the proliferation of images of pain in the media and also in academic spaces, particularly in the network as well. And we've talked about, you know, the ethics of engaging with distress and what it means to really be constantly re-exposed to trauma or stories and narratives that have a lot of personal resonance with us and there's some sort of connection to lived experience as well and the toll that takes on you when the work you do isn't just purely academic but also personal and it's that sort of personal professional boundary for better or worse often doesn't exist and we've talked then about how these images sort of counter that as Tanisha said can be a survival strategy also but also in my research I suppose I've been really interested in healing, but also how healing's sort of been drawn into this very neoliberal or capitalistic sort of idea of wellness culture and self-management, and then how much of this joy or this sort of push towards engaging with particular forms or performing particular modes of joy then is for someone else's gaze or becomes this very, oh, you need to self-manage yourself and perform wellness. Um, And how much does that sort of suppress the fact that pain exists and we still need to pay attention to what maybe is not as visible but should be more visible which is all the structural violence and everything so we've been thinking about joy as something that that's tricky it's not as not just an uncomplicated sort of outpouring of positive emotion it can also have a lot of political charge to it. That's two such incredible introductions to the kind of meaning of black joy and it being kind of synonymous 
with resistance mm. and struggle and survival yeah thank you so much for sharing that it'd be really great to kind of roll back particularly for you Tanisha and find out a bit about how you came to be doing this work like how did you come to be senior lecturer (laughs) in race and health outcomes at King's because that is such an achievement like where where did it start that's such a big question I don't know I'm still I mean it's my dream job so I'm still very lucky and I mean academia is such a difficult space it's so competitive and it's it's so challenging for so many people so I'm really lucky that I'm able to to do that work um in terms of where it all started I mean my interest in black joy honestly came from my own observations of how I use it in my life so I'm writing a book at the moment that's looking at um ideas of grievability so like who we grieve and why we grieve them and how that's shaped by racialized logics of kind of blame Um, So kind of thinking about people of colour and how um, people of colour are disproportionately blamed for things like health outcomes because, for example, you might avoid healthcare because of histories of medical violence and therefore you might not be vaccinated at the same rates, you might have worse health Mm. outcomes and then this kind of perception that actually that's your fault. Mm. Um, So I'm writing this book and it's a really difficult book to write. Um, It's a really interesting one and I think the topic is really important but in terms of me personally, I just find myself at the end of the day kind of going on social media and looking at images of like black babies laughing and like Mm. images of black joy to kind of countered that where I've been kind of sat all day thinking about black suffering. It's like a natural kind of impulse. And so I was like, why am I doing this? Like, it's really interesting because a lot of my work critiques neoliberalism and this kind of idea of self-management and and this idea that we're responsible for our Mm. our own health um, when our health is, our poor health is kind of the outcome of systemic violence. I mean, why is that our responsibility, right? Uh, So I was kind of critiquing myself. I was like, why do I think that my response to this in order to improve my kind of health at this point is to look at these images of of black joy um so yeah that's where it started it's like a a self-reflection i guess that's brilliant do you know what i'm gonna make you do aria (laughs) yeah so this happens every few episodes Mm -hmm. on spine society please can you define neoliberalism Um, I think you could do it. (laughs) Well, I wouldn't be best positioned to offer a working definition. I definitely direct people to read some of Wendy Brown's amazing scholarship, but I can sort of situate the way I think about neoliberalism in my own work. Um, And if you're interested in Wendy Brown's work, Edge Work, her book, that's a particularly good resource to really think about neoliberalism as sort of a government a form of governance or political rationality. I've been thinking about it in terms of how neoliberal modelings of the self or this understanding of individual responsibility has permeated healthcare discourse. Um, So it's a mode of governance that sort of extends, so shifts responsibility from the state or the structural onto the self um, and how that sort of colludes with healthcare, healthcare discourses. So like Tanisha mentioned, if bad health is the outcome of systemic violence, for example, my work looks at mental health particularly, how this very sort of neuroscientific framing of distress as a neurochemical disorder or imbalance sort of then shifts the responsibility into individual management. So it's your mental health or your distress, your pain is deeply biologized and hence it's contained within you and so are your resources and Mm. the infrastructure, quote unquote, it's within you and internal and individual as well. And it then detracts from that sense of, well, it's a structural collective responsibility. Systems need to change and structures need to change. It's not that I need to go and be more mindful or journal or take my medications, even though these can be incredibly helpful things. We also need to look at the bigger picture. Um, And I think I was also particularly interested then in this very individualist mode of understanding the self and how that sits against a lot of indigenous understandings of self and um, our orientation, our relationship to the to land, mm. to each other, um, how health is also deeply relational um, and embedded in a network of, you know, community and relationships and not just, yeah, not just this sort of, yeah. That's a really powerful, really powerful description. And it's so interesting how often we get daily reminders that the state is so committed to neoliberal logics when it comes to 
medical health, medical health outcomes. And like when you were talking to Nisha about um, your work and then just then with your explanation on um, neoliberalism, Aria, I was thinking about the most obvious one for me more recently mm-hmm. is thinking about COVID-19 yeah, yeah. and thinking about like black and minority ethnic people and how that they were um, disproportionately affected mm-hmm. and died of COVID-19, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. how the rhetoric around that mm-hmm. was very much focused on our kind of occupations as well yeah. as our kind of diets and mm-hmm. all these yeah, different yeah. things. Absolutely. It's like, wow, like you're so, the, the, the fastness, the uh-huh. speed in which, racialization or racism becomes in proximity to morbidity. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. And there were even really worrying and extremely problematic conversations initially about our biology being different. Yeah. So like susceptibility, like Mm. we are biologically different. Of course we're not. Mm. Yeah. Those conversations, I mean, this is 2020, right? I know. Mm. And like how you really, that sort of slips into, well, historically rooted, almost eugenicist sort of discourses and how all these different rhetorics are sort of persistent they've just taken like mutated in different forms and these are you know existing yeah things that are so historically rooted um in terms of understanding what the mechanism of black joy could we give some examples of how you're finding both solace in this but also a, a deeper scholarly understanding of what it could mean for people aria and i are talking about how um I mean, I was kind of saying that I find it quite a difficult thing to critique because Mm. it's something that so many people claim for themselves and rely on in, in, and again, I include myself in this. I'm a bit of a hypocrite in critiquing it because I I practice it. Um, But yeah, it's such an important thing for people to kind of do for themselves. And it feels a bit uncomfortable to critique Mm. it because in critiquing joy, you're kind of critiquing people's ability to kind of achieve a form of happiness and you don't Mm. want to do that Mm. right like everyone wants joy everyone wants Mm. happiness the combination of like imagery Mm. music Mm. collectivity yeah Yeah, absolutely I think Tanisha and I are having a really sort of interesting conversation about this and we're thinking then it's not so much about using well using joy as a personal resource is one thing but then feeling like you have to perform joy as a political demand mm. in order for an external gaze that's that's a different yeah, thing you know yeah. and that's when it can sort of become politically pacifying and not as liberatory or you know a political act of resistance when you need to perform i don't know um a particular identity as the well assimilated sort of condition especially i don't know to counter stereotypes of you know the angry black woman for right. example then in which case what what function is that joy serving really um yeah and i think you see that a lot in order to access certain spaces you need to to be coded in a certain way I think. definitely and like you almost get into a situation where you do get into a situation where i both want to present black joy as resistance but i also want to be in defense of black women being able to be angry yeah, yeah. absolutely so it's so interesting how the kind of monitoring mm. of our beings is so integral to how the state reproduces our humanity. Yeah. 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 And one of the amazing things about Black Joy is that it also, for people that use it and kind of for proponents of it, it's a way of, of humanising Black people, right? Mm. Like we're not just the suffering that you see on TV we're also people that experience joy like everyone else. Mm. So it's it's about presenting a holistic recognition of what it means to kind of live as a black person, which feels like strangely radical. Like that's not a radical thing, but for a lot of people that is that is quite radical because they don't see it. I think one of the things that's been really interesting over the past three years since the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement that you, you mentioned, um, Tanisha, is this kind of expectation of black people to perform a Mm. version of themselves. And that's always existed. But the the monitoring of who we are and what we quote unquote contribute, thinking here about what you said about neoliberalism, feels almost like it's intensified. Mm. Intensified in what way? I think that intensified in the, the gray areas between our existence feel less clear to me and I know that sounds a bit bit mad but it's like okay right today I need to do black joy today I need to do black Mm, resistance mm. today I need to do this Mm -hmm. and it's like we're constantly 
moving away from the category of a human to, mm. to think about Sylvia Winter here. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think there is this difficulty there and like we also spoke about having the capacity to have joy to begin with mm. because joy always comes with baggage mm. and it's complex, right? Like two or three things can be true at the same time. You can perhaps be joyful or happy mm. um, but equally be deeply pained by what's going on and yeah. it's difficult often then to have to perform this while also wanting other parts of yourself to be dignified and mm. seen as well um, and I think that's often the difficulty right people cannot see things yes. holistically or in a complex yes, nuanced way it. and you're like afraid of how much this performance of joy or I hate the term adaptability is almost mm. quoted as resilience so oh yeah it's great you're, mm. everything's fine you know during the protests where you had a lot of black people coming out and like dancing on mm. picket lines and things, um, which is amazing because that's that's a demonstration of black joy mm. as a form of resistance to the black pain mm. that you're protesting against. You know, it's like yeah. though at that moment, those two things are operating at the same, same time. That's really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. That's really powerful. So when it comes to understanding the connection between joy and wellness, how did you come to this work, Arya? Um, so I was really interested in, first of all, I was interested in alternative framings of distress. So I grew up with, um, I grew up in a South Asian household and with a Hindu upbringing. And I think a lot of um experiences or engagements with distress up religiously coded in some ways. Um, so I was really interested in particular in voice hearing phenomenon um, and how that's that's coded um, spiritually and religiously as well. And I was just thinking about alternative forms of knowledge and things. And that led me into thinking about healing, because if we understand distress as something that's non-biomedical, then perhaps, or that we can hold space for ways of understanding the self and being that lie beyond the medical, then that should extend towards healing and what we can sort of draw from other forms of knowledge in terms of our relationship to the self and our relationship to others. And I felt like there, there was this need also to think about how health is not just an insular thing, but it's also our relationship to the land and mm -hmm. thinking very much about my personal investments and in, say like climate activism and things like that, how historically mm -hmm. a lot of racialized minoritized and marginalized communities have had a very extractive relationship towards land and labor and how that affects health, but also continues to affect the way we're able to access resources for healing. Mm. Um, That's really powerful. And like listening to Tanisha talk about mm. um, her book and scholarship about like grievability, and then listening mm. to you talk about here about like stress, like you can mm. really see the connections. Like yeah. I feel like these are these are two like key issues within social mm. life or how we relate to them that we don't actually speak about that much. No, and I think being in that sort of like medical humanity space as well and thinking about the intersections with the environment mm. and environmental and medical humanities are so inseparable. Mm -hmm. um, I think the real turning point for me as well was, um, well, now Elliot Page's documentary, There's Something in the Water and mm. thinking about environmental racism and how that sort of racial concepts of racial weathering and slow death this idea that you know environments that exposure it's yes it is our health is epigenetically informed but also deeply structural and how we think about these things mm. um, and there have been studies that have shown that those epigenetic changes mm. have guys what's epigenetic so i mean i'm not a geneticist or like scientist <laughs> but, yeah, uh, you are. <laughs> uh, in that kind of sense but from my understanding epigenetics refers to changes in your genetic makeup so um it's looking at how your your genes essentially adapt um depending on the environments mm. that you're in boom and oh God, i hope that's right <laughs> <laughs> uh, there have been studies that have shown um so for example there was a study that looked at 9 11 and pregnant women and the kind of exposure to that stress and how that affected their their unborn babies and in terms of their kind of um their genetic makeup after mm -hmm. they were born and there were studies as well that looked at um muslim women who were pregnant at that time and after they received the kind of um, racism and discrimination they did post 9-11, how that affected their children. Uh, so essentially that means that you as a person might not experience racism yourself, but you're still affected by it because mm. of the racism that your mom experienced while oh, she was pregnant Oh God, it's so deep, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. yeah. 
why do you think it is that 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 the combata- combination of like kind of intergenerational stress, mm. intergenerational trauma, um, grievability, like thinking about the fusion of these together. Why do you think it is as a society we we don't talk about it? But why is it uncomfortable? It's uncomfortable because I think once you confront it, you have to do something about it. Mm. And I think there is so much passing of the buck when it comes to healthcare and so much suppression of inability to sit with discomfort and confront Mm. discomfort because I think people feel almost personally victimized or blamed almost for it, which again comes back to the gaze, right? Like, why do we need to perform joy and happiness? It's so that you can sit comfortably um, knowing that, I don't know, you're woke enough to (laughs) accept this or something. Um, That's such a good reason, explanation. And it kind of gives me a little bit of solace, actually. Like, um, listeners will know that um, my husband died of cancer in um, March 2022. And um, one of the things that, obviously, I've um, been going through a process of um, grieving and healing, but... um, I have multiple neurodivergent traits and one of them is dyspraxia, which is a developmental coordination disorder. And since he died, I have definitely, well, I know that my dyspraxia has intensified in terms of my coordination and how I can kind of get around. And it's so interesting thinking about how like kind of stress or the grieving then impacts mm. the health. Mm-hmm. Like I know, I know there'll be lots of people listening to this that kind of also have their own examples of that but it's just so interesting how we don't really have the language to talk about that in everyday life Mm -hmm. or when we do there's kind of like the label of what you're what is actually happening so in my case death and grieving Mm -hmm. is used instead of actually explaining what it is that's happening so much cultural discomfort around talking about Death or Death, any yeah. sort of negative emotion. Yeah. And I think we're so wrapped up in politeness formula that mm. we're not actually seeing people or seeing seeing things for what they are. Definitely. Um, and like that politeness formula, I really like that phrase. I really like that <laughs> phrase. That politeness formula is kind of doing the opposite of healing as well, isn't it? I think it's doing like really deep violence, honestly, because there is so much labor involved in suppression and repression that comes back in cycles. And I Mm. I think often about, you know, the reproduction of harm through cycles of transgenerational trauma. And I I can't remember who said this, but I think it must have been some YouTube video or TED talk that I watched and someone said trauma that pain that isn't transformed is transferred or transmitted. And that just really hit very hard. Pain that isn't Transformed, transformed is, is transmitted. transmitted. Yeah, and so much sense. yeah, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? And if we don't have the space or the resources to even engage with pain, mm. then it's no wonder why you know cycles of trauma are being reproduced. Or re- and then obviously, it always again with this whole reframing of distress as individual, then you get parental blame or caregiver blame. But no, it's much wider than that, isn't mm. it? Um, A lot of us are so conditioned to think of our pain as being something very individual Mm. like our grief is our own Uh, which is interesting because the way that we grieve and practice grieving is very shared Mm. like we have funerals and kind of commemorations and yeah memorials and things so it's a shared thing but I think a lot of us still think of it as something that's very private Mm. because our emotions are private the ceremony around death is in is collective yet the processing Mm. of death is individualized. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know, I was thinking about um, what you said there in terms of uh, Zinzi Clemens mm-hmm. and her novel, What We Lose. So that's semi autobiographical and it speaks to her experience of being, of caring for and then going through the process of grieving her mum, who has mm-hmm. cancer. And she was talking about how she was given these pamphlets. Um, when her mum was in hospital about the stages of grief, the stages of bereavement. And she's mm-hmm. like, well, in actual practice, none of this maps in the same way that I was told my grief should look like. Um, or I was told to process emotion. And then who do you go to? And Because n- no support group is going to engage with the complexity or the nuance. And this almost guilt to feeling feeling any form of joy at any point. Because then you're like, well, does that detract from the fact that I'm still in a process of grieving? There's this yeah. Yeah, inability to... Reconcile, yeah, reconcile the joy and the grief. Yeah, complexity or yeah. being able to have the capacity for 
Yeah, I wonder why that is. Like, why are we not able to sit with joy and grief? I suppose Mm. that's what black joy is doing, really. It's coming out of a place of of grief, like, as a response to Mm. that, as a form of resistance. It's like, I can grieve, but I can also celebrate the good things that I have Mm. as a black person going on. And there are lots of them. Um, So, yeah, I wonder why we're so uncomfortable with sitting with both and why we think Mm. that they cancel each other out. I think you answered the question at the beginning of the podcast, and I think it is to do with neoliberalism. Mm. Like, there's not the space or time to grieve because we are part of the means of production Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and being part of the means of production doesn't align with spirituality or healing I think Mm. I think that that I think that the the glitch is capitalism Mm. and our ways to resist capitalism is through as you say Tanisha Black Joy but Mm. it it can only go to a certain point because if you fall in kind of deep grief or if you fall in deep distress Mm -hmm. the end product you become someone that is not productive Mm -hmm. and when you're not productive you are then labeled Mm -hmm. and just and up for disposal Mm -hmm. and obviously it's not as binary as that but these are the kind of logics that we live in don't we in a capitalist society absolutely i think when you're like you said when your self-worth is so like mired in ideas of capitalist value Mm -hmm. you're not seen for any other type of value I think and I was also thinking then with what you said about capitalism there isn't a time and space according to like the capitalist clock I suppose self-management happens in the morning your little meditation mindfulness <laughs> practice and then you go to work and you come <laughs> back and you do yoga yeah. again speaking as a hypocrite that's exactly how my day no, looks same, like. <laughs> like literally meditate and then get straight on my laptop it's yeah like, exactly God. Like, mindfulness now emails yeah <laughs> that's so true so Ari and I were talking about who joy is for. Nice. Um, and we were talking about how black joy historically has been kind of weaponized and misconstrued. Uh, so, for example, during the transatlantic slave trade, when you had people who were enslaved who were made to dance on plantations for their owners. Um, and there's this amazing section in Frederick Douglass's narrative where he talks about uh, slave songs so hearing enslaved people singing and how white people at the time thought oh okay well that's a sign that they're happy like mm-hmm. that's a justification for it and he said well that's the ultimate sign of of sorrow mm-hmm. when you hear those songs it's a a complete misconstrual of what that supposed that's joy so is yeah um yeah and we we see it throughout history i mean it's an interesting thing when you you think that you're seeing joy when actually you're seeing pain mm-hmm. It means that something's off there. Something's not being communicated. And then that joy, I mean, is that for you then? Is that for it? Because mm. for me, then at that point, that becomes a, a thing that's constructed for someone else. Mm. Um, even things, I mean, this, we're going off a massive oh, tangent, but even things like when you think about minstrel shows and things that were supposedly kind of demonstrations of black people being joyful because that's, that's a, that's a happy place for white people to be in at that point um in that point in history because it's like it's almost a justification for that subjugation um but it's completely false right we know and i mean these people weren't even black a lot of the time they were white people with with blackface um so it's interesting to think about how black joy is constructed and how it's kind of held and preserved for black people and like now now and how it historically hasn't been um, and whether those two things are completely separate or whether there are... What were your thoughts on that, Aria? No, I was really... So we were talking about that, I think, in terms of consuming or, like, spectating Black Joy, then, like, what what purpose does that serve for us or why, why we feel the need then to... And we know yeah. that, like, Black Joy or Black creativity mm. as well becomes something that is extracted... Mm-hmm. It's extracting our joy or extracting what we do mm-hmm. as a way to tr- uh, to transmit joy for others mm-hmm. um, and finding that balance as well, particularly, again, like bringing in capitalism mm-hmm. is really interesting because like black music, like mm-hmm. black creativity, it's the way that we have in the past and presently contribute to um society and that's how some people make money but like Mm. that black joy is something that can be bought and sold as well 
I think that's the difficulty, especially when creativity as sort of a survival strategy or as a tool of political resistance gets commodified. And that's almost like an ine inevitability in the sort of capitalist system. And I don't know, I feel like what's particularly harmful now as well is that spectatorship of pain for the sake of signaling something about yourself, particularly when you're witnessing and you're like, oh, yes, I'm engaging with rap or appropriating particular forms of what has a lot of cultural mm. capital or has been used as to to signal signal or signify something about yourself and your acceptance, quote unquote, of um yeah, I, I think a lot about this in terms of decolonization or diversity discourse in particular. Um yeah. Definitely. God, how look at us three academics. I can't believe we've managed to <laughs> sort of find the the critical overlays of black joy. Like can black joy not just be black joy? <laughs> the joy out of the joy. Yeah, we just suck the joy out of the joy. <laughs> it's true. Again, I I think it's a really difficult thing to critique for that yeah. reason. Because part of me is like just leave it alone. Yeah. Yeah. I Let know. people experience joy. It's all right. I want Sometimes joy. I wonder, and we were talking about this as well, how much of this is just, you know, an inability to take your ideological hats off. Like, mm. you know, you can't enjoy anything. And, oh, sorry, see, there we go. <laughs> this gossip trap. You can't enjoy anything because we were talking about, oh no, am I like outing us? Like the reality TV. The oh, we, love love it. we love reality yeah. TV. Yes, yes. Oh. I will not like be apologetic about the fact that I yes. will veg out on the couch with reality Same. TV yeah, on a Sunday yeah. night. That's my praxis. What's your show? Like, oh, I love Bling Empire. Bling Empire, <laughs> yeah. I love Selling Sunset. Sell it. Oh, I'm watching the latest season of Selling Sunset, oh, yeah. I haven't watched that one. I'm mm. all about the MTV ones. You know, like, the, they're super problematic, but they're so interesting. Like, Team Mum UK. Oh, team Mum. Um, I used to watch, like, Making the Band and stuff, like, oh, in the okay. noughties, yeah. like, some of the original MTV reality mm -hmm. shows. Did you watch, like, Pimp My Ride and stuff? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cribs. Yeah. Cribs. Yeah. Oh, I love all Cribs. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I mean, like no, 90s think, generation. But it's so yeah. really, it's really interesting, isn't it? Like, as academics, like, we take ourselves so seriously, but actually, it is in the mundanity of life or in our kind of everyday practices of existing and belonging, where we are carving out space of joy. Like, I'm a bit mad why I'm mad, which means I find a lot of joy in work, like, I actually do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's loads of different reasons to to criticise that and the example it sets to people in terms of trying to be resistant to capitalism. But also like I find a lot of joy in um, listening to music and what I'm trying to do in my own scholarship now is kind of intertwine that within who I am as an academic mm -hmm. because that those things mm -hmm. around joy are so important to how I then am able to come and talk right about Gramsci, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important to do as academics because, I mean, we were talking about academics that do things, that er research areas that are completely different and de like separate from who they are as people. Mm -hmm. um, but for those of us that do research things that directly affect mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. it's important to reflect on, on how you sit with your work, mm -hmm. right? Like how you kind of into your work mm. um I, I recently did a qualitative study on colorism and i interviewed myself for it mm. and it was such an interesting like weird situation where you're kind of you're sat with your i had my phone and i was like recording myself reading out my interview questions and kind of just talking to myself and it was actually really useful because i was like okay this question doesn't quite work because you've already kind of asked it but also the things that come up are really interesting and embedding that and kind of using that data alongside other people's data is really interesting. But yeah, or, like I think it's really important for us to be self-reflective mm -hmm. and kind of to recognize our positionality in our work mm -hmm. because so much of it is is really intertwined with with mm -hmm. who we are as people. And it's something that I find quite difficult to um to kind of explain to to friends outside academia who who have like 9 to 5 jobs who are like mm. oh leave your work at like leave your work at work come home and i'm like i can't like i'm still thinking about you're this just thing in your it reflective me, practice yeah, yeah. You, you're like oh that reminds me of being like a little girl and that something like that happened to me and that's yeah. that person's story yeah. you can't like it's so hard to separate the two that kind of what you said about positionality i think is so important and we would do well to recognize that positionality is not just about us kind of it's really important that we situate who we are structurally but also situate how we come to know and by that I mean the the, the joy around us and how yeah. that informs what we do mm. and going back to black joy I mean it 
it's important to remember that it's not like a monolith, right? Mm. Like, and that that I think is potentially one of the traps of Black Joy. It's kind of like this is a way of expressing it. Mm. So, creating a TikTok video where you're all laughing, or um, I don't know, like doing like a dance or something like that. That's mm. Black Joy. When for different people. I mean, it's a bit of a weird one, but for me, if I were to think of like what black joy means for me, it's like making sweet potato pies with my dad. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. And that is a very specific like African-American kind of thing because we don't really have that here. So I think with black joy, it's important to remember that like not everyone expresses joy and feels joy in the same way. Mm, yeah. And all of these forms of joy are completely valid. Mm. This has been such an invigorating and important conversation. Thank you so much for sharing for on you. Black Joy. Um, there's so much. I feel like this this kind of work on Black Joy, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like this is the start of some really crucial scholarship. Yeah. Yeah, I, there's not a lot of work in this area. No, no. Really isn't. I think there's a lot in terms of or affectist resistance, you see a lot of Ahmet, Sarah Ahmet's mm. work on the feminist killjoy, which is so important and like, you know, working against happiness as a mandate. But I think in terms of thinking about the complexity of joy or letting mm. two things be true at the mm. same time or how we translate sort of ideological hats on, academic hats on, hats off to a ground level reality. I think that's that's a conversation we really need to... Yeah, I know the Stephen uh, Lawrence Research Centre, they had a conference on Black Joy, I think, oh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, okay. yeah. The centre is um, led by Dr Lisa Palmer. As we're seeing more kind of black scholarship be, or it's always been valued, but get that kind of institutional seal of approval, I think we're going to see much more work like this that detracts from pain and focuses on, yeah, resistance through love joy thank you both so much thank you so much for having us. we'll see you next week thank you for listening to surviving society to support our work you can rate review and subscribe to host or produce a series of surviving society get in touch with us via twitter or instagram